Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This message has a couple titles. One is the victory of the cross. The other is what happened from the cross to the throne. What happened from the cross to the throne. It's actually on one of my radio series called the Resurrection Series. And I taught this. So I'm going to try to teach a whole week of lessons in one message. Praise the Lord. So we're going to study the work of the cross, but not just the cross, but what happened after the cross. You know, the church, and we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and and I, I felt the Lord wanted me to do this tonight, because in most of our Sunday morning services and the messages and sermons we hear, we see Jesus on the cross, Amen. and we see him nailed, and we see him give up his breath and say, it is finished. And we see many times the soldiers come take him off the cross and carry him and put him in a tomb. And the next thing we see is we see them opening up the tomb, um, the Mary and going to the tomb and seeing it's empty. Well, guess what? There were three days and three nights in between. And that part doesn't get talked about very often. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is what happened from the time he gave up his breath until the tomb was emptied. But I'm going to back up a little bit further from that. I'm going to try to do this quickly, but to give background to the whole salvation process, the, the, the redemption process that Jesus came to fulfill and things that we must understand. Number one, we must understand that because a man was the cause of the fall, it had to be a man to bring redemption. It could not be an animal. It could not be a bull or a goat. For one reason we know is because the blood of bulls and goats will never pay for the life of man. We read that in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13, 14, and 22. And for time, I'm only giving you references, whereas I would normally read you the verse. I'll just give you the reference. Hebrews chapter 9. You know that the blood of bulls and goats will never pay the price. But um, in uh, Romans five nineteen, for just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, many are made righteous. So a man had to be the tool or the vessel or the sacrifice for redemption. Jesus was qualified to pay this price. And we need to look at why he was qualified. And in other series that I've done, for example, the Blood Covenant series and some others, I've shared a little bit about the legalities of spiritual laws. And God is a legal God. And even though Satan breaks laws and rules and regulations because he's a liar and a thief and a killer and a lawbreaker. He holds God to the laws because if God ever broke a law, he would become a lawbreaker and he would fall under Satan. So, Everything that God did through the process of redemption had to be done legally. Let me back up and show you what I mean. When God created man in his own image and breathed life into him. I love Genesis chapter one. And these are some of my favorite verses, but 26, 27, 28. But in verse um 26, when God created man, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion, authority over the earth, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over all the earth and all the creatures on the earth. So God gave man authority. Okay. So now who has the authority in the earth? Man does. Does God have it? This is not on the earth. This is where millions of Christians and hundreds and thousands of preachers are wrong, where they say God is in control. He is not in control where he gave man authority. And he gave man authority in the earth. He is in authority in heaven. The Bible says, but the earth he has given to man. And so man was in authority in the earth. God is not in control 
of what's happening on earth. God is in control of his plan of redemption. God is in control of time. He's in control of the beginning and the end, what we call an earth lease in which he gave man authority to rule on the earth for 7,000 years. It has a deadline and expiration. When it's up, Jesus comes back and becomes king of the earth in the millennial reign. So there's an end to the rule of man. There's a timeline, a designated period, a lease period with an expiration date. And during that time, man is in authority on the earth until Jesus comes back and he becomes king and Lord of the earth. But during this time that we're in, man is in authority. So man had the authority over the earth. But then Satan came in through the body of a serpent, tempted and deceived Adam and Eve so that they obeyed Satan. They listened, hearkened and obeyed Satan. Well, in Romans 6, 16 says, when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as a slave, you, be, you are a slave to the one you obey. Romans 6, 16. So immediately man who is crowned in God's glory in his image, a beautiful creation in the likeness of God, right up there under God, he fell, 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 fell from the glory below the angels, not only the angels, but below the fallen angels under Satan. Man, okay. when he sinned. Man fell from the glory, fell from the authority, fell from the sonship, fell from the relationship with God, fell from rulership under Satan when he obeyed Satan and he had a new master and a new Lord named Satan. Even to the point that the animals can even overpower man, whereas before the animals were under man. But now the, the animal can kill a man. So man fell under Satan. Okay. Now I see Satan is standing back going to God. Ha ha ha. What are you going to do now? What do you got to do now? I've got your man. He's mine. And you can't come in here because you gave him authority. He gave me the authority. I've got the authority now. And that's why 2 Corinthians 4, 4 calls him the God of this world. And so then even, you know, when the temptation of Jesus, Satan tempted him. And one of the temptations was Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory and said, I will give them to you. Some people would say, oh, that was just a lie because he's a liar. No, because Jesus would have discerned a lie and wouldn't have been tempted. A lie would not have tempted him. It wouldn't have been a temptation. And the second thing is because the kingdoms of the world were given to him by Adam. Okay, so now we have Adam under Satan and mankind under Satan. Now has be, they have become slaves. Slaves to Satan. Slaves to sin and slaves to the curse of sin and death, which produces sickness and disease, produces poverty, lack, and hunger. Is God at fault for the hunger? No. Is God at fault for sickness and disease? No. no. It was the cause of the fall and sin that came through Adam and Eve. And so Jesus was qualified. I'm talking about the legalities. So now God is legally kicked out. So what I'm trying to show you is God could not legally just come 4,000 years and send Jesus as a baby born of a virgin. He would be intruding in territory that was not his own. And Satan could have legally kicked him out, said, no, you don't have any right to come in here. This is my territory. And he had to hold God to legalities. And so God had to work legally to get access. So what did he do? Just like Satan went to a man and got the authority from a man. Jesus did the same thing. But he didn't use deception. He didn't come in the form of a serpent. He came to a man named Abram and said, Hi, Abram, I'm God. Amen. No secrets. No hiding of his identity. I'm God. And I offer you a deal. You make this deal with me. You 
and I come into a covenant together. We cut blood together. You become my covenant partner. And I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And all the earth will be blessed through you. Adam, uh, Abram, okay, it's a deal. I'll do it. Cut the blood, cut the animals, and then cut circumcision. Sealed a covenant with God. Now God has legality. He's in partnership with a man. Legalities are so important. He's in partnership with a man. But still, another thing had to be done. He had to ask Abram for his son in order to have the right to give his son. Because that's all covenant work. Because when one covenant partner gives, that's what covenant means, that what one partner gives, the other gives. And so he was really sneaky. He said, Abram, I want your son. Okay. Abram did it. Gave him back, raised from the dead, as though he were raised from the dead. But that was the legal right that produced 2,000 years after Abram the right for Jesus to come. Because he had legalities. And through the line of Abram, through the line of David, he had a son born in the earth as a man. Mm-hmm. Woo! Hallelujah. As Billy Brim says, oh, what a plan. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, what a planner. I mean, who would have thought of that? He had to have a legal right. And he had to get the access to come back into the earth. Okay, I'll be born as a man through my covenant partner. And I'll have a right to come into the earth and redeem mankind as a man. What a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus had the right to come in, be born of a woman because God made covenant with Abram. It gave him a legal access glory to God. But then Jesus was also qualified because he was sinless. He committed no sin. If he had sinned, his death would have only paid for his own. Everybody would have to pay for their own sin. But because he was sinless, his death paid for all mankind together. And the Holy Spirit testified in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was without sin. Jesus said of himself, John 14.30, Satan has found nothing in me. And even in Luke 23, Pilate and Herod both testified, we have found no basis for the death penalty. There is no cause for death. Pilate and Herod testified in Luke 23, verses 13 to 22. But there was one more thing Jesus had to do to qualify. He had to be born as a man to get into the earth. He had to be sinless to be qualified as a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. One more thing he had to do, though, before he could even go to the cross, he had to pass the same test that the first Adam failed. You know, when you go to school, if you fail a test, what happens? You take it again. And if you fail it again, you take it again. And so the first Adam failed the test of temptation. He was tempted and he fell into sin. Well, in order to qualify to be the redeemer, Jesus had to take the same test. And he had to pass it. So we read in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, for 40 days he was in the wilderness and Satan tested and tempted him with sin. And because he stood and resisted and said, it is written, it is written, it is written until Satan left him because he gave up. He couldn't think of anything else to say. He, he couldn't think of anything else to say. Isn't that great? I love it. The devil ran out of things to say. So he left. Well, he passed the test with an A plus, 100%. Now he's qualified. Now he can go to the cross. He is qualified to be a redeemer. And I think most Christians don't even realize all these things. These were three things Jesus had to do to be qualified to go to the cross or he could never have gone to the cross for us. But he did it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So Jesus was the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 
47, the first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. The second man, Adam, was from heaven. So he was the last Adam and passed the test of the first Adam. Now let's go to the cross. And I want to point out to you something that I pointed out on our radio program. And if we look at Isaiah 53, which for sake of time, I can't read to you Isaiah 53, or I'd love to, but you know Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. And you know, you just go home and read it, Isaiah 53. But let me read to you verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, most every English translation translates the word death as singular death. But the Hebrew is actually plural. And And there are a few translations that are rare that will actually make it the way the Hebrew is written. Death is with an S. Deaths. The Hebrew word is a plural word. And so he... Where did it go? He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his deaths. With the plural, S. So that means there's more than one death that we're looking at here. And so we need to understand this. Jesus did not only die in the body. And that's what a lot of Christians also only think about. They only are aware of a physical bodily death. But it was more than that. Because we are made in the image of God. And how many parts are we? We are, number one, spirit and soul and body. Was it only the body that fell? It was the spirit and soul and body, all three. So if only the body got redeemed, then what happens to the spirit and soul? They're not redeemed. So he had to die, spirit and soul, and body. And this is another thing you don't hear in most resurrection messages. You only look at the death of the body and the suffering of the body. But the suffering was also spiritual and soul. And the death was also spirit and soul. Because he had to pay for our redemption, spirit and soul and body. Otherwise, our bodies would be saved and our spirit and soul wouldn't. So, we have to understand that Jesus died in spirit and soul and body. And he suffered in spirit and in soul and in body. After, in Isaiah 53, 11, it says, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. It doesn't say the suffering of his body. Most people only look at the suffering of his body. But it says after the suffering of his soul. Also, um, where was the suffering of the soul? It began in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22. Let me back up. There's a scripture in Corinthians, I believe. I, I, I need to get this reference. For some reason, it slips my mind. I like to quote this verse. But, um, and I think you gave it to me last time. <sighs> Let me remember that if we would share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. Romans 8. Romans 8. If we share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. Okay. Now, a lot of Christians think that the suffering of Jesus that we share in is sickness. Is that true? Disease? Is that true? How about poverty? Those are not the sufferings of Jesus. He did not ever suffer sickness except on the cross where he bore it. He did not ever suffer poverty except on the cross where he bore it. Those are not the sufferings of Jesus. Let me back up and show you the sufferings of Jesus that we are supposed to share. There, there's a difference between his sufferings in his death, which was our, the price for our redemption. I just turned that up. And there's a difference between the sufferings of his life and ministry. And we are to share in the sufferings of his life and ministry. Not his death. Because his death was what he paid for us. He did it for us. We could never do it. But what he did in life, what he did in life was for our example. 
what he did in death was for our substitution. Amen. Got it? His, his life was our example. His death was our substitution. So there were three sufferings in his life that we read about. And the sufferings in his life are basically, one is persecution. We know he was persecuted. Two, it says in Hebrews that he, was, he suffered being tempted. Well, you don't suffer giving in to temptation. Right. You suffer overcoming temptation. Amen. Resisting. Right? He didn't succumb. He didn't give in. He overcame. He resisted. He said no. That was suffering. So he, was suf- he suffered. Hebrews chapter 2 is where I believe it is. Hebrews 2. And he suffered being tempted. If I will find that for you. I'm trying to hurry, but... I think I guess I need to give you that. Yep. 2.18. He himself suffered when he was tempted. Hebrews 2.18. So he suffered being tempted and resisting. Not succumbing, but resisting and overcoming and being victorious over temptation. Two, he suffered being persecuted. And three, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered in dying to self-will Not my will, but your will be done. That's an easy thing to read. And it's another thing to do. And to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And to die to self will and surrender Not that we can't have our own choices, but we do have our choices, but we yield our choices to the master and say, your will be done in my life. So those are three things that if we share in those, if we share suffering, temptation and resisting and being victorious over temptation, if we share in persecutions from in this life, and if we share in dying to our self-will and saying to the Father, not my will, but your will be done, then we will share in his glory. That's what qualifies us for glory, isn't it? Isn't that what qualifies us for glory? So we will share in his glory by sharing in those sufferings, not in what he did on the cross, because that's what he did for our substitution. All right. So he started his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed Luke 22, verses 41 to 44. He prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like great drops of blood. There are some people who have read that and have even denied that's not even possible. It is possible. It has been medically proven possible, but it is very rare. It is such extreme intense pressure that the blood vessels of the forehead forehead burst. And so he suffered in his soul in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what was ahead of him, knowing not only the physical, but the spiritual, which we're going to talk about but also the physical that people don't even fully understand and we still don't fully understand, but we'll try to talk about it. But there was a depth of suffering unlike any human being ever has gone through and never will and never could that he knew he was facing. And so he suffered in his soul in the garden of Gethsemane, knowing what was ahead of him, knowing all the sufferings, even of hell itself. And saying to the father, not my will, but your will be done. So he started with the suffering of his soul. Then he went to the, um, you know, the trial, the tribunal and was found guilty and went to the Roman soldiers and was taken to the whipping post. And well, even before that, you know, you saw the story in the play last Sunday. I'm sure they had a play at your church. (laughs) Probably (laughs) most churches had a play. Um, But, you know, they stripped him and they whipped him and they put a crown of thorns. You know, those crowns of thorns that was said the thorns would be like three or four inches long and they would actually jab it down into the head. So it went three or four inches deep and there's punctured holes into this into the skull and blood dripping down from the head. And then it goes to the whipping post. Now, this is the part I'm going to read to you out of Geike's life of Christ. 
he describes Christ scourging as this. And, and then also we're going to look at some of the early church historians such as Eusebius and what was a scourging like? Because most of what you see on Sunday, on television, on movies was not correct. Even as great as the passion of the Christ was, it didn't quite get it. And actually, even the best we could do, we'll never get it. But let me give you, th- this part was not even shown. They couldn't put this in a movie. Victims condemned to the cross first underwent the hideous torture of the scourge. Jesus was seized by some of the soldiers and was stripped to the waist, bound in a stooping posture, his hands behind his back to a post or a block. He was then beaten at the pleasure of the soldiers. Now, some people get the idea of the 39 lashes because that was a Jewish custom. 39 lashes. It was the law of the Jews that they could only give 39. He wasn't beaten by the Jews. He was beaten by Romans. Romans did not have a limit. And not only that, but Romans were bloodthirsty. Think of the arenas where they fed people to the lions as sport and filled tens of thousands of people in the stadium to watch a lion rip a person apart limb by limb and eat it and devour it. And everybody in the stands stands up and cheers. Yay! I mean, that is a bloodthirsty culture. When they boxed with one another, they used nails in their boxing gloves to poke the person, and it was to death. And they would aim for the eyes to pull the eyes out first. They would have a, be able to win over their enemy. I mean, this is for sport. So they, these were Romans. They were not Jews, and there was no law about how nice to be. He was not beaten by the Romans. He was be- by the Jews. He was beaten by the Romans. And they were bloodthirsty. They used a cat of nine tails. And I say at the pleasure of the soldiers, meaning until they were tired or until they got bored. But if one got tired, they could pass it off to another for his turn at the sport. So there was no limit to how much they could beat. And so they used the cat of nine tails, knots of rope or plated leather armed at the ends of each whip. So it's not just one where you see the lines on Jesus back really pretty. Not a little red stripe, a little stripe of like today, if they used a leather whip one at a time and you'd see three stripes on their back, that's not what happened. This had cat of nine tails, like nine arms all at once. And the ends of each one had either acorn shaped drops of lead or small, sharp pointed bones. So they acted like teeth. They were teeth. This whip was like a tooth and every whip literally grabbed dug into the skin and tore it off grabbing with teeth like and pulling teeth and pulling and ripping flesh skin muscle everything it could reach pulling it off the body so they were dismembering the body in many cases not only was the back of the person scorched Cut open in all directions. I mean, rip, rip, pulling the skin off until the flesh, the muscles, the sinews are laid bare and pulling those muscles off. But then as they were skillful, they could wrap that whip around the front. They wrap it around the head, grab the face, pull off the nose, knock out the eyes, knock out the teeth. Wrap it around the chest, rip open the chest and pull it off. The breast was torn. The face was all ripped up under countless stripes to the point that the victims sank into uh, incoherence. What do you call it? Um, Unconsciousness. Thank you. Unconsciousness. And even in screams and convulsions and distortions, they would go into convulsions and distortions into unconsciousness and even sometimes died on the spot. It was often to the death right there at the whipping post. Died on the spot. Otherwise, they were taken away, now unrecognizable. Unrecognizable mass of bleeding flesh to find their deliverance in death. 
The scourging of Jesus would have been of the severest. The soldiers were glad to vent on any Jew what, you know, they hated the Jews. And then he was going to be scourged. I mean, he was going to be crucified. So if you scourge harder than the less time there would be at the cross to keep them waiting for his death. The Eusebius, the early church historians, also described a Roman scourging as this. All those around as witnesses were horrified at the scourging, at the whipping post. Horrified. I mean, you couldn't hardly watch it unless you were Roman. They were horrified to see the person so torn that their very veins were laid bare. The inner muscles and sinews were exposed, even the bowels were exposed. So we see this is what we have not heard really very much about. Jesus suffered in his body. And then on the cross, Matthew 27, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Why? Because it was a custom to administer a stupefying or a numbing drink to help alleviate the sufferings and to disturb their intellect to not be sensible. In other words, to make, to, to make them you know, insensible and to not be aware of their condition. Jesus refused that drink. Amen. So he would be fully sensible and aware and fully suffering, feeling all of the pain. The second time they offered him a drink without the gall, without the numbing, stupefying potion, and he, he received it. It was just the plain vinegar. And he received it. But he chose to endure the fullness of the pain and the suffering in every way with total mental clarity. If I had time, I'd like to take you to Psalm 22. I'm going to do it a little bit. I do it in more detail on the radio. Because Psalm 22 is such an amazing prophetic picture of what happened to Jesus on the cross and in hell. Um, if you look at Psalm 22, it starts out with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said that on the cross. I want you to see that everything in 22 was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross or in hell. It was the picture of cross, the cross and his time in hell. That's this is partly where we see what happened in hell and how he got out of hell. What he did when he was in hell and how he got out is in Psalm 22 and also Psalm 88. We will uh, see some of it there. But we see here what Jesus cried out. So they only heard him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was probably quoting the entire psalm. They only heard or only recorded the first part of it. But he would have quoted the whole psalm. And then you see that it was fulfilled. All the prophecies I am scorned by men and despised by people. Fulfilled. John 3, 14. That was verse 6. Psalm 22, 6. Fulfilled. John 3, 14. Psalm 22, 7. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults at me, shaking their heads. Fulfilled. Matthew 27, 39, and 41. The Pharisees mocked him, hurled insults, shaking their heads. Exactly fulfilled in Matthew 27. They, the Pharisees, verse 8. Psalm 22, 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Fulfilled. Matthew 27, 43. Exactly quotes it word for word. And so then down to verse 12. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. In the Old Testament, bulls are symbolic of demons. So we had demons surrounding him. Well, of course, it's the sacrifice of mankind. It's the son of God. Probably every demon on earth showed up to watch. I wouldn't be surprised. Bulls or demons surrounded him. Roaring lions. Tearing the prey open their mouths wide against me. Lions that represents leadership. It would have been the Jewish leadership. The Pharisees scribes and teachers of the law. And, um, you know, all those that accused him, those are the roaring lions. 
tearing their prey, open their my- mouths wide against me. Fulfilled Matthew 27, 41 to 43. The, that was the Jewish leadership. Lions represent leadership. This is the Jewish leadership. I am poured out like water. All my Jones are out of a joint. That's what happens when you're hung on a cross because they have you hanging in a way that your body falls. I mean, it pulls your, your arms out of its socket, your shoulder socket. Everything is so pulled and twisted that your bones get out of joint. And then my heart is turned to Mac wax my and has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They gave him vinegar, vinegar to drink. Then verse 16, dogs have surrounded me. Who are the dogs? The Romans, Gentiles. You know, the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus said, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. It was the Gentiles. Well, who, who were the Gentiles at the cross? The Roman soldiers. So the dogs are the Roman soldiers. Verse 16, dogs have surrounded me, the Roman soldiers. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Notice it was the dogs, not the lions. Prophetically, it was so perfectly accurate. It didn't say that the roaring lions, it said the dogs. Because it wasn't the Jews, it was the Romans. They have pierced my hands and my feet. The Romans pierced him. I can count on my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They, verse 18, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Fulfilled, John 19, verses 23 and 24. But you, Lord, be not far off. Oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword. Rescue me from the lion. Save me from the oxen or the bulls. Uh, and from the power of the dogs, verses 21, 22. So that's a quick, uh, we're not done yet, but that. Up to that point, we're looking at Psalm 22. He became sin. Second Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. You know, Jesus was not just carrying sin. He was made to be sin. Now, we have a hard time understanding that exactly. But let me say it like this. Transfigured. We have an idea of transfiguration when he was on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, and Elijah came, and um, Moses came on the mountain, and he was transfigured in glory. Well, on the cross, he went through another transfiguration. But he was transfigured, becoming sin. No longer being recognizable. This is where we have to look at Isaiah 52, Verses four, verse 14, Isaiah 52, 14. I'm going to read it to you in three translations. Amplified Bible, I'll read first. For many of the observers, the onlookers, the watchers, as they saw him, I'm adding this, I'm explaining, this is when he was on the cross, looking at him, hanging on the cross. Those who observed For many, the servant of God became, transfigured, became an object of horror. So all of our pictures, even the Passion of the Christ, where he still looks like a man, which you'd have to use, you know, technology to make him no longer look like a human being. But where he still looks like a man, it's not right. Because as he was on the cross, he went through a transfiguration. I, I would say he looked like an ugly, horf, horrifying demon. As horrible as they can ever look. He is transfigured on the cross, no longer a man, but a horrifying, hideous creature. doesn't look like a man anymore a horrifying hideous creature those watchers would be eyes bugging out what is that yeah no kidding I'm very scared yeah <laughs> for many the servant of god became an object of horror horror many were astonished the niv says many were appalled Amplified, his face and his whole appearance were marred more than any man's, partly due to the beatings, because he's ripped apart. 
But not only that, now he's going through a spiritual transfiguration and his form was beyond that of the sons of men. His form, no longer the form of a man. He looks like a different kind of a creature. Just as many were astonished at him. So his whole appearance, his face and whole appearance were marred and his form was beyond that of the sons of men. NIV, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. No longer looked like a human being. The new revised standard says, just as there were many who were astonished, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. He was transfigured into a hideous looking creature, not a human being anymore. And they were watching in astonishment. They were astonished. They were appalled. What are we seeing? And that's something you don't hear about. It happened. Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop into glory in the glory of God, but he was transfigured again on the cross into sin, becoming sin, becoming an unrecognizable creature, no longer in the appearance of a man. He did this for the penalty of sin, for the wages of sin is death. So we said he suffered in his spirit, soul, and body. Well, he suffered and died in his soul in the Garden of Gethsemane. He died to self-will. He suffered in the, the body at the whipping post. He died on the cross. That leaves, we talked about the soul. We talked about the body. That leaves one more, the spirit. So we need to look at the death of the spirit. What is the death of the spirit? The death of the spirit is separation from God. The death of the spirit is separation from God. And even Jesus said in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God. Why are you so far from saving me? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. Separation from God. And it also then includes the miseries that come from sin. Spiritual death takes upon itself all the miseries of sin. Well, as he was made to be sin, he took all the miseries of sin, which were, you know, sickness and disease, poverty and lack, but it's also fear. It's also torment of every kind. It's anger. It's hopelessness, helplessness, you know, everything that came from sin. And so that is death. He received it all on himself, becoming that on the cross and then to be followed by the wretchedness of hell. Hell itself is the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death and the culmination of that is in hell. Hell was created for Satan and his demons, not for man. But when man chooses to serve Satan and not to serve God, man will get Satan's punishment. And so Jesus had to pay the price and go to hell. Now, some people will, and some preachers have said, well, Jesus didn't go to hell. That he only went into paradise. Because he did say to the man beside him today, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, the other guy was going to be in paradise. <laughs> the, the, the criminal, not Jesus. But they were going to be able to communicate with each other. Because Jesus cried out um, on the cross, it is finished. And we're going to look at that. Let me, let me do that right now. Let me flip to the back here. He cried out, it is finished. It is finished does not mean that he still, he still had to go to hell. He still had to go three days and three nights in hell. But what does it is finished mean? The Greek word is tetelestai. T-E-T-E. -T -E, L-E, 
S-T-A-I. Tetelestai. It is finished. And Greek scholars going back to the days of Jesus to find the use of that word tetelestai in the modern time of Greek that he was in had different meanings. One, by the the definition of tetelestai, it means to bring to completion, to bring to conclusion, to complete, accomplish, fulfill, finish, and to execute and carry out a command which he did, carried out the Father's command. And it is to reach completion, maturity, and perfection. So Jesus' exclamation did not mean that he hadn't gone to hell and he wasn't going to go to hell. It wasn't just all done. There was still another work to be done. But what did it mean? It meant, Father God, I have carried out your command, mission accomplished. It meant number two, It was also equivalent to the Hebrew word. If that was Greek, carried over. The equivalent in Hebrew was the word spoken by the high priest when he sacrificed that lamb without spot or blemish. The priest would speak in Hebrew the same thing. It is finished that it means in Greek. And So annually, every year, the high priest would have to enter the Holy of Holies and kill the sacrificial lamb and pour its blood in the mercy seat. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was declaring the end of the sacrifices. The end of killing the bulls and the goats and the lambs. The end of animal sacrifices. It is finished. No more offering of sacrifices because the ultimate sacrifice has been paid. All sacrifices are finished forever. Number three, it was also a word, tetelestai was a word used in the business world to describe the full payment of a debt. The debt is paid in full. Like when you stamp paid in full on a note, that's exactly what it was. And so when a debt had been fully paid off, the the parchment on which the debt was recorded was stamped that said tetelestai. Tetelestai, meaning paid in full. So when a criminal was sentenced, they had a sign over their head of the charges written against them for why they're being crucified. This one's a murderer. This one was a thief. Whatever crime they committed, whatever they were found guilty of was put on a parchment and hung above their head as they hung on the cross. That was the bill of charges against them. It is, the, it is what they are being crucified for. It was the indictment against them, what they are guilty of. And so, you know, we remember they put a sign over Jesus' head too. And it was the, sen- it was the um, sentence. It was, it was the accusation, what he was found guilty of, and it was also the sentence. Um, sometimes a criminal would be sentenced to 15 years of prison. It would be written down 15 years of prison, whatever. So when the sentence was fulfilled, like if it was a prison sentence, 15 years in prison, then that parchment of s- stating his sentence would be stamped to the last die paid in full. Our sentence was nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter two. You were, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code. The King James says, blotting out the the handwriting of ordinances against us. The complete Jewish Bible says the bill of charges, the regulations that stood against us. He removed it by nailing it to the execution stake. He, uh, the New American Standard, he canceled their certificate of debt, the New Living, the record of charges. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2, 14. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So he nailed all of our sins and the accusations that were against us. All that Satan, the accuser of the brethren, 
could say to God, this one sinned, they did this, they, they lied, they cheated, they stole, they committed adultery, they're unfaithful. You know, all that was written against us. It was put up on there on the cross and Jesus paid the price and it was stamped, tetelestai, paid in full. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And it is finished means one more thing in classical Greek. It also depicted the turning point when one period ended and a new period began turning point when one period ended and another period began so when he cried it is finished it was the turning point in the entire history of mankind for at that moment the old covenant was completed and fulfilled and the new covenant began and it became the great divide in human history in which men can now come to God freely and become sons of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So that was all in the uh, s- statement, it is finished. Jesus laid down his life. They could not take it away from him, his life from him. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, he humbled himself, became obedient to death. John ten seventeen and 18, Jesus said, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. And in John nineteen thirty, he gave up his spirit. They could not take his life because he was not guilty. He would never have died. Because he himself was sinless, he would never have died. But he gave up his life and humbled himself and became obedient to death. He gave himself over to death. And then in uh, his death, Matthew 27 talks about um, the darkness from the um, sixth hour, that was 12 noon, until the ninth hour, that's three o'clock in the afternoon. Darkness came and then there was an earthquake. And by the way, I don't have time to go into this now. It's again, it's on the MP3 of the radio programs. And I talk about when did Jesus die? Now we celebrate Good Friday and um, people, you know, traditionally say he died on Friday. But Jesus said he would be dead for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, you count from Friday to resurrection Sunday morning. That's not three days. Three nights. I think everybody, even down to L- uh, kindergarten, has figured that out. <laughs> But why do they say Friday? Because it, they, it's also written that before the Sabbath day, they had to take him down off the cross. Mm-hmm. And that's what confused everybody. Mm-hmm. But do you know what? All you have to do is go back and read the Old Testament. They were in the middle of a feast week. Mm-hmm. A feast week. It was the feast of Passover. And there was what was called a special Sabbath. It was not the Saturday Sabbath. It was the special Sabbath of the feast. And so during feast week, you'd have two Sabbaths. You'd have Saturday Sabbath and the special Sabbath of the feast. So by my research and calculations and and study, I would say that Jesus died on Wednesday. And he It became dark from noon Wednesday until three o'clock Wednesday. Then you know that the the disciples came and asked for his body. It had to be off the cross by six. And even the the Jews said, we've got to get these bodies down because the Sabbath begins at six o'clock. Or I I, forgive me, not six o'clock sundown. Sundown, whatever time, whenever sundown was, it would change, you know. So at sundown. The special Sabbath. It was not the Saturday Sabbath. It was a special feast Sabbath for the Passover week. And so they had to have his body off the cross by sundown. So the disciples came and took his body away. And they wanted him put in a tomb so that they could go and then honor the Sabbath day starting at sundown. And they would have to stay into their homes from sundown to sundown and and observe the feast and the Passover all that they did, you know, on that special Sabbath. Then you'll notice that the the women were going to prepare his body. They had to make herbs. So then they were going back. They could then work from Thursday sundown to Friday sundown because it was just a general work day. But then the Sabbath, Saturday Sabbath began on Friday sundown. So there were two Sabbath days that week. And that's what fools people because it was before the Sabbath. They had to get this body off. And so they thought it was the Saturday Sabbath, but it was not Saturday Sabbath. It was the special Sabbath that was an additional Sabbath in that week. 
And so they would have taken his body down before sundown on Wednesday. They would have all gone to their homes from Wednesday sundown to Thursday sundown. From Thursday sundown to Friday sundown, they can work a regular work day. They can prepare. Oh, they had to prepare the spices. It takes time to prepare mummification. You know, prepare all the spices. So they would be in, ladies be in their homes preparing, preparing, preparing. And then they all have to stop and put everything aside at Friday sundown. And then honor the Saturday Sabbath until Saturday sundown. Then they're free to go out again. And early on the first day of the week, the women went out to the tomb trying to find him. And he was gone. So praise the Lord. But there you see... As I understand it, and from my study, now some people would say different Thursday, but that way I also see it is that that's three days and three nights, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday night, Friday night, I mean, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. Well, why don't you say Saturday night, Cherry? Because let me show you one other thing that, that I have questioned. I'm, I'm not saying that I've got this all right. I'm saying I've studied it a lot. And our tradition is that he rose on Sunday morning. The Bible doesn't say that either. The Bible says the women went to the tomb on Sunday morning and he was gone. It doesn't say he rose on Sunday morning. And so being that three days and three nights, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, after the Saturday Sabbath at sundown, it would have been the f- completion of the third day. He could have been raised from the dead anywhere from Saturday sundown onward. He could have been raised from the dead at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., midnight, 2 a.m., whatever, which would not have counted as a full night that Saturday night because we don't know when he was raised. And that's another thing that people get confused about because they assume that he rose on Sunday. No, the women went on Sunday and he wasn't there, but we don't know when he was gone. And so it could have happened any time after Saturday sundown to finish the three days, three night period. You understand? Praise the Lord. So the darkness came over on Wednesday from noon to the ninth hour and The earthquake came, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, and that was a miracle because it's like, what, eight or 10 or 12 inches thick. No man can tear it. It had to be God. And it was torn from top to bottom, and it was like 15 feet tall. And so that had to be God, saying that the way into the Holy of Holies is now open. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So then Jesus went into hell. You have time to give me just a few more minutes? Yes. You got to get this story to its climax. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus went to hell. Now, some Christians will say Jesus didn't go to hell. He only went to um, paradise. No, he had to go to hell because the punishment for sin is hell. And if he didn't pay the price, you would still be going to hell. If he didn't go to hell, you would still have to. Because hell is the punishment sin so if he didn't go to hell you would have to go to hell he had to go to hell he had to go to the lowest of the bottom of the bottom of the pit and so um there's so many scriptures here i can i'm I'm out of time to give you but i'll give you references revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 the bottomless pit is called the abyss jesus went to the abyss it's recorded in in the hebrew it's the word sheol Psalm 18, back in the Psalms, 18.5, the cords of Sheol entangled me. That was hell. That was the underworld. That was the pit, the place of no return. The cords of Sheol entangled me. Psalm 88.6, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. That was not paradise. Isaiah 53.12, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was not numbered with the righteous, with the transgressors in his death. Matthew twelve forty. Jesus himself testified as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. So the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Acts two twenty four. 
God released him from the horrors or the agony of death. You see, paradise had no horror. Paradise had no agony. It was a place of comfort. He was released from the horrors and the agony. And that word also means pain, sorrow, and travail, and intolerable intolerable anguish. Intolerable anguish. That is Acts 2, 24, the Greek word for horror. From the horrors of death, intolerable anguish anguish and agony acts 227 you will not leave my soul in hell hades jesus himself said you know this is the quoting of the old testament but it's referring to jesus peter is preaching using old testament scripture and saying this is jesus this is what jesus did and it says you will not leave my soul in hell hades acts 231 His soul was not left in hell, Hades. It is called the torment compartment. It is the infernal region, the place of wrath, torment, sorrow, pain, and darkness. It was never used to refer to paradise, that word. So Jesus did not go to paradise. He went into hell because he had to pay for our price. Ephesians 4, 9, he, dis- he who descended into the lower parts of the earth. Well, we read in Luke 16, the, the, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It was not a parable. It was a true story because Jesus had a certain man. And he named the man Lazarus. When he told a parable, he never said a certain man. And he never gave a name. This was a real man that probably most of them knew a man named Lazarus and a rich man who went and then he talks about the paradise being above hell where the rich man was in hell and Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham, bosom of Abraham and paradise and the man in hell, the rich man looked up and saw Lazarus. So they were close enough together to be seen and they were close enough together to talk to each other. The ones above in paradise look down at the ones in torment. The ones in torment looked up at those in paradise. And the rich man says to Abraham, send Lazarus to dip his tongue and his finger to cool my tongue, his finger to cool my tongue and in water. So, you know, he was in, he said, because I'm in torment in these flames, you are in comfort. And, and And Abraham said, you are now in torment and Lazarus is now in comfort. But they were able to talk to each other, look at each other, hear each other, carry on conversations. But Abraham said, but there is a deep chasm or gulf between us so that no one can go from there to here and no one can go from here to there. So there were two compartments. Paradise was above the torment place of hell. Paradise was the place of comfort, comfort where Abraham and Lazarus and all the righteous were. Hell was below the place of torment where the wicked were. And they looked at each other. They talked to each other. The people in hell saw the comfort of paradise. The people in paradise saw the torment of hell. And so Jesus went into hell and he paid the price. And so Jesus, what did he do in paradise now in psalm 88 i don't have time to go there in psalm 22 it talks about he preached in hell let me show you psalm 22 though and then he let me quick um let me quickly look at psalm 22 when um we go back to psalm 22 and verse 22 so now he's in hell starting in verse 22 And so he's in hell. Now remember, you've got to understand, the people in torment could talk to the people in paradise. The people in paradise could talk to the people in torment. They could see each other, hear each other, communicate with each other. So Jesus is in torment, but he's preaching to the people in, uh, in, in paradise. Psalm 22, 22. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. Verse 23, you, you up there above me, I'll add that. You who fear the Lord, 
praise him, you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he is not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one, me. He, our God is not despising my afflictions. He has not hidden his face from me, but has listened to my cry for help. From you, from the Father, comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. So now he's, he's got an assembly. He's got an audience. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vow. I think this is so awesome. All of paradise, the righteous, and all of hell were watching, and all the demons were watching Jesus fulfill the vow, the covenant, the sacrifice, the torment, pay the price. In other words, there were multitudes of witnesses that could, G Satan cannot come back now and say, oh, it didn't really happen. Jesus wasn't really in hell. You know, he doesn't want to admit he lost his most important prisoner. His prisoner escaped. <laughs> And so he said, well, he just wasn't really here. No, there was a multitude of witnesses that saw him. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, will I fulfill my vows? There are witnesses that are watching me do this. Witnesses watching my torment and my sufferings. And he begins to praise the Lord. And it goes on, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. And then it ends in verse 31, says he has done it. It's the equivalent to Tetelestai, it is finished. He ended again with it is finished, which is, this is the Hebrew part. And so what did he do? He had gone into hell and paid the price and all the righteous and all the wicked were witnesses and onlookers of his, sub, of his sufferings. And he testified and preached to the sons of Jacob and Israel. And then it says in 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20, Christ died for sins once for all, all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Verse 19, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The spirits. He preached. What did Jesus do in hell? He preached. He suffered and he preached. And he preached and he suffered. He preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. So Jesus was preaching while he was down there in the place of torment, horror, agony, and intolerable anguish. Can you imagine? I know. <laughs> Did that bring them any relief or did it just make them worse? <laughs> Because Satan had illegally taken Jesus captive. Now, because Jesus didn't sin, now Jesus has a right to overthrow Satan. Now, how did he overthrow Satan and how did he get free? Psalm 22, 3. You inhabit the praises of Israel. So what did he do when he was in hell? After he preached, he praised. He praised and he praised. Verse 25, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. And they who seek the Lord will praise him. All the ends of the earth will remember the Lord. And he goes on and he praises and he praises and he praises. And God inhabits the praises of Israel. So when he began to praise, what happened? The presence of Almighty came down into the depth, the lowest pit of hell. Because God inhabits praise. Hallelujah. And I see Acts 16 when Peter... I mean, when Paul and Silas were in prison in Philippi, mm -hmm. 
in the Philippian jail, at midnight they began singing praises. And at midnight there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors of the prison flew open and everybody's chains came loose. That is the picture because they were singing hymns and praising God at midnight. Midnight is the time symbolized as the worst, the darkest hour. Jesus in his darkest hour in the lowest pit began praising. And I believe there was a rumble in hell. I believe hell began rumbling and shaking and there was a violent earthquake in the depths of hell and then all the prison doors flew open and Jesus chains came loose and with him all of the righteous in paradise and it says in in um uh, while he before let me not jump ahead then he disarmed colossians 2:15 he disarmed the powers and authorities so after his chains came loose they fell off there was the great earthquake and rumbling and chains came off of him he turned and he stripped satan and he disarmed him and he led him in a public spectacle around hell i expect Triumphing over him. Now that phrase to make a public spectacle, it has to do with the New Jerusalem Bible says he stripped the sovereignties, paraded them in public behind him in triumphal procession. That's the New Jerusalem Bible. The complete Jewish Bible stripping the rulers of their power. Um, some of the um, Lexicons say that means to lead someone as a prisoner in a victory procession in to exhibit and to celebrate in triumph over. But he stripped him and disarmed Satan. Well, he took the keys of death, hell and the grave. Revelation 118. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death and hell. Amen. And so he left Satan with nothing. Nothing. He stripped Satan. Now Jesus owns this plan and everything in it. And we are his joint heirs. The church is now in authority in the earth with Jesus as the head. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so Jesus disarmed Satan and then He was raised from the dead and he passed through the grave and picked up his body and went right on ascending into heaven. Ephesians 4, 8 says that is why it says when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Who were the people in his train? It was the righteous people in paradise. So Jesus broke out of his chains. He stripped Satan and disarmed him and he began rising, 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 rising. And as he went up, all the gates of paradise opened up and the thousands and the thousands of people in paradise came into his train and he went up, 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 up. He went through the grave and he picked up his body and went on up, 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 up to the highest place. And now he has been given a name that is above every name. Woo! Hallelujah. Our champion, our victory our victor and he has led all the old testament righteous into heaven so now they're all in heaven and those loved ones you know who have gone before you are now in heaven and he is coming again soon to to take you and me into heaven and then he will set up his throne on his kingdom on the earth forever hallelujah Woo! glory to god jesus we praise you We praise you. We praise you. You did it. 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 Hallelujah. You are our champion. You are our champion. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you.
praise you and we magnify you. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. You paid the price nobody could pay. You suffered what nobody could suffer, and you won a victory that nobody could win, and you gave it back to us, and now you have been given a name that is above every name, and you sit in the highest place above all thrones. Your throne is above every throne, and Lord, we worship you and adore you, and we thank you. You have made us your bride. You have made us your church. You have made us your body. You are the head. We are the body. And you have chosen. It has given you pleasure to share your throne with us and that we would rule and reign as kings and priests forever with you in all, for all eternity, all ages, as it says in um, Ephesians 2, 6, that for the ages to come, it is as age after age rolls on and on and on and on, you would display the riches of your grace to us. And we will celebrate with you forever. Oh, we're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're thankful, Father. We're thankful, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we praise you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.